Yes, lads, UFC fighter Jack Shaw here. You can catch me on the latest episode of Ace Podcast Nation. Make sure to give him a subscribe on YouTube. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash Ace Podcast Nation. And uh, looking forward to get back on there soon. Speak to you soon. Hey guys, I'm Sai. Welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, the home of the Danny Batten Fight Show. This is episode number 40 at 54. I do apologise. Wow. We're going to be talking uh, last night's UFC, some boxing, bit of news coverage, bit of Cage Warriors and a bit of everything else in between from the fight world. You can watch the show, uh, video versions, youtube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation and download the audio versions at uh, all your favourite podcast platforms and apps just search ace podcast nation and you'll find us there ace podcast nation also home to many other great shows and series featuring top guests expert analysts and more so uh, give us a follow on social media subscribe to the youtube channel Uh, but if you do just want to keep it sort of mma and boxing follow the danny batten fight show on instagram and twitter which is at danny batten fs and uh, a way to streamline your Ace Podcast Nation experience, as it were. But uh, joining me for the last show before Christmas, it is uh, former Cage Warriors champion, UK MMA legend, Mr. Daniel Button. How goes it, Danny? Yeah, yeah, all good. Uh, I suppose most people heard about the tier fours, which you know, yeah. where I'm living, we fall into. So, yeah, I did a bit of Christmas shopping. I thought, well, I'll, I'll sort you know, one of one of the kids out, and then uh, I'll, I'll do the rest Monday, and then boom. Oh, I mean, the, <laughs> the amount of people who I um like dads and like working dads in it, so they leave it. Like my one mate, he leaves his shopping to Christmas Eve because he likes the the kind of last minute aspect of it, but also like he works like sixty hours a week. But he likes doing it, like he likes the buzz of it on Christmas Eve, everyone's busy and he likes it, so he's literally got no Christmas presents apart from one or two he's got for his kids. And he was just like, 10 o'clock last night, he was like, well, what, you know, what am I going to do? Stuff yeah, like, I, I, we're, at, we're actually talking about maybe doing it in the new year, like, yeah, it's, at some point it's in the beginning difficult, of the It's yeah, one of them, mate. Time. And uh, joining us is... Jo- joining us again, I should say, is Cage Warriors featherweight and fresh off his dominant victory versus Kingsley Crawford. It is Mr. Ben Ellis. Welcome, mate. How are you? Hi, you guys. Yeah, all good. Thank you for having me on again. Indeed. Top man. I was, uh, yeah, I was hoping to get you on like before your fight, but obviously you were deep in camp. And uh, how did you think it went, mate? Because you were quite agitated afterwards. Um... It was it was a weird one. It was I, I wouldn't say it was a particularly great performance, despite I thought it was very, very clear that I won. Um I thought like I say the commentary was a little bit misleading. I'm actually really grateful that we ended up having the argument that we had. Because you can literally hear me laughing at him saying that you know you've lost. But I think if it hadn't have been for that and then Joe Bloggs is just listening to what the commenta- commentary is saying. They were well. They were saying it could be a draw, and it's just so far no. in the case. So, like individually, I wasn't too happy just because I know I'm a few levels above that. But at the same time, he's a good fighter. Um, his only losses have come to high rank guys. You've got uh, James Henry and uh, Aiden Stephen, um, and say first two rounds, I just I shut him down. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of them. Not not too happy, but then obviously happy to win clearly so yeah could be worse. when you say you, you weren't happy what part of the tools you're not happy with is, is it, you had a game plan and initially i, I take it your game plan is worse but is there aspects of your game plan that didn't work or what's led to you not feeling happy 
Um, I was really disappointed with the lack of damage on the floor. Um, I say he, he didn't really show any ability to stop the wrestling. Um, they they were commenting on his takedown defense being quite good, but it, it's one of them. It's like um, I think on the first the first MCM he shut down two or three different sequences and then he's down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, just because you delay it doesn't make it good. Like, it's good for me. He's going to have to stop what I'm trying to do and then re-attack. Um, and again, then all the damage on the floor was was little stuff, little, little nicks. Other than there was three left hooks on the way to the floor, which hurt him badly. Um, so, yeah, that was the main thing I was upset with, was the lack of damage. Um, I suppose a big part of that, i got to give him credit. But it's one of them. I felt like his only aim was to not get sparked on the floor. Mm. So when someone's being that defensive, like he was only really looking to control my posture to grab overhooks. But anyone who's grappled, who grapples knows for you to get up, you're going to have to be digging for underhooks. I literally yeah. don't think he established an underhook once in the whole fight. Mm -hmm. um, so my attitude was, well, if you're happy to lie there, granted not taking too much damage, then that's fine. I'll just lie on top of you forever. Um, so that was the, that was the main disappointment. Um, it was just yeah, lack, lack of damage. Um, but then at the same time, I literally have not got a mark on me. Um, so yeah, could be worse. Yeah, but I suppose that's when you you could have two different level of strikers, and then a striker coming out being disappointed because he just couldn't engage in striking. But then again, someone can backpedal so much and, and just play disengaging. I suppose so. You know, sometimes that's not down to. You know, any shortcomings for you that you didn't get your, your ground a pound off and your damage off as much as you want. It, you, you kind of summed it up yourself rather than, you know, taking any potential damage to try and scramble up and make something of each round to try to steer the fight in his direction and take risks. He sat there and played, played safe, literally physically safe, but um, obviously was letting the, the, the rounds go, you know, go slip by. So I don't think you should take it, you know, too personally on yourself that you've done anything wrong. If he's going to curl up in a ball and, and just pl play super safe, but not try to win the rounds, which effectively is what's happened, you know, you should, uh, yeah, you can only do what you do and can only fight what you've got in front of you. And you had someone that was really cagey, so. Yeah, no, thank you, mate. To be honest, that's what that's what most people have said. Like, obviously, when, when the fight ended, we had like a day or so. And then it was all just um, reviews with all my coaches. And, and they, they pretty much said that. Mm. Um, so yeah, and you stop being depressing and just yeah, mm -hmm. positive. Uh, but so, some of a great fighter though, look, to to be evaluating yourself and, and, and micromanaging yourself, saying, "Hey, you know, I got the win. I'm happy with that, but I want to be more performance." You know, that just goes to show how you know how much you're you're willing to push yourself by stripping back your game and having a look and be like, "No, I need to find a way of, of, of doing better." There, you know, it, it's a, it's a good sign. Yeah, and again, it's tricky isn't it because. He, he was quite cagey. Um, he was going backwards the whole fight. Um, and then it felt like he was going backwards, going backwards. He'd throw something really wild and it would miss by a mile. And rather than commentating on the defense, the commentary was, oh, if that lands, it's All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my attitude was like, well, yeah, of, of course. Like if you swing a bat and it hits someone, it's going to hurt, but you've got to land the fucking thing first. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a bit frustrating, and I did. I thought, whilst I was disappointed with the performance, I thought I made him miss a hell of a lot. Um, yeah. He is, he is a good striker. It's not like I'm making some random guy miss. He's a, he's a good striker. Mm -hmm. He's got plenty of knock knockdowns, um, and he does tend to do damage in his fights. And he did barely hit me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. So obviously, Jim, we we just had a chat before we started recording about like you were visibly agitated afterwards, like I mentioned. Um, and we've talked, me and Danny, and I think probably the last, in the, we've done two shows of we since Cage since the Cage Warrior show. And we've it's yeah. come up about the commentary, and I think some fights were frustrating um, from a commentary point of view, and yours was one of them. Like it didn't feel that the commentary was reflective of what was going on in the cage. Um, obviously, Jordan's was another, but there was a couple of others where you just didn't feel like the, the commentary was connecting to what was going on in the cage. Now, obviously, at the time, you don't know that. You know, you're just uh, you're just fighting. What got you so riled up afterwards? Um, well, it's, it's just my luck. 
that um, the fight ended, and for me then, when that happens, everything gets forgotten about. Because once you've had a fight, you can't do anything else. So I went over to shake hands. Um, I offered my hand out, and he said no. So then I told him to pray. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, which he is. I mean, he, he just had 15 yeah. minutes to say and do whatever he wanted to do. He didn't yeah. do very much. And then all of a sudden he finds his voice. And it's funny because his nickname is a silent assassin. He <laughs> said, fuck all in the fight. Didn't do any assassinating. And then the fight ends and all of a sudden he's not so silent. <laughs> so yeah, I just thought he made an ass of himself. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I mean, unless you speak to me, nobody knows that he did not. He didn't accept the handshake. Literally no one knows that because it's not on TV. Yeah, he wasn't on TV. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, a, it's a weird one. But like, so obviously I, I think I texted you the next day and I said like, I didn't really like the way he was being because I felt like, look, you've just been dominated for three rounds. You shouldn't be saying anything. You should just be kind of take the win. I didn't know he hadn't shook, like he'd refused your handshake. But I just felt like he had plenty to say. And I was thinking, from from my point of view, I was looking and I was thinking, you've just been dominated in your fight. Just take it on the chin, shake hands, say well done, and then go away and say what you want and do what you want. But in that moment be a professional isn't it? and like just you've had your fight you've done it leave it at that and he just like you say he had a lot to say afterwards which they caught on the camera they caught both of you sort of going back and forth but like you said they didn't catch why but you know it is what it is but like for me i get frustrated sometimes with fighters like in any um promotion where like do you do you talk in beforehand if you're gonna if that's what you're gonna do and then when you get in the cage, do what you're going to do, say what you're going to say. And then afterwards, mm-hmm. that's got to be the end of it. You know what I mean? Because yeah. otherwise it's just, I think it makes you look like you lack a bit of class. Like, Yeah, definitely. And, and what do you think about that? Go on. Oh, sorry, sorry about if, if you have issues with somebody after you fought, then you probably didn't fight the way you should have been fighting. Because um, again, he, he, they, they missed this on camera. He said something like, oh, I'm not even tired. And he did a one arm push up. So I just looked at him and I was like, well, mate, if you're not tired, why on earth didn't you try harder? Yeah. yeah. Like, that's entirely on you. And then I just did a press up back. Mm-hmm. Fuck me. Mm-hmm. If you're a pro yeah. fighter and you can't do one press up, then fuck me. Got to <laughs> um, so I don't know what the fuck that one, one press up proves. It's a weird one. Dan, what do you think of that? Because obviously, like, you watched the fight and then you saw the sort of aftermath and that. But obviously, you've been, you know, you're a former Cage Warriors champion, champion in other. Uh, mm. promotions you've been around the block as it were what um like do you feel like when fighters don't shake hands afterwards it it just reflects badly on them i always think but i'd be interested in your take on it like if there is like it's not as if ben and um crawford went back and forth verbally for the whole build-up there was all this animosity and then you know it there was still a bit of that afterwards like there wasn't that, so it, it was a weird one. I'm just interested in your take on it. Yeah, I'll, I've had it before. When I fought Demacio Page, um, you know, he was utterly disappointed with his performance, and, and he should have been because he didn't get past even one minute in the first round. He threw his gum shield down and didn't want to shake hands. And so I thought I let him have time to, to cool down. And a little later, I went into the changing room to say, hey, look, you know, I've, I've been sick as really quick as well. You know, I know what it feels like. You know, don't want to come back from it. But he wanted none of it. He wanted none of it, even, you know, even sometime after in the changing room. You know, a good half hour had passed, um, you know, after we did our med- medicals mm. and what have you. But, yeah, th- this happens. I don't know. It just, it just doesn't bother me. If, if someone wants to lose badly in, in that way, and then that's up to him. It just it can say something about the character. But I think in in your situation, Bennett, when you know, you you had this little freck on me the after, I just think it might may well have been just the whole frustration of how the fight went for him. I mean, you talk about disappointments and you lose your you know, imagine losing and, and being disappointed because it looked like he just couldn't get any of these games off. And like I say, he was swinging and missing by a mile. And he just wasn't collectively getting anything, anything going. He had his own whole game shut down, and it must have been, you know, woefully uh, frustrating because not only did he lose each round, but you know he couldn't even exert himself because he was kind of always being put in check. Okay, you know, the checkmate with the outright finish, but 
he just never got to express his game. And, you know, maybe that was part of the thing. Or it might have been, you know, the, the word had got back, you know, you spoke about sending him a message and maybe that message got back to him and he felt it made things a little personal. And, yeah. Um, yeah, who knows what goes through people's head, but, you know, us fighters, we're, we're a different breed and um, some people act a certain way and some others act another way, you know, it's just the way it is. To me, I think when the fight's done, the fight's done. And, uh, you know, you, you could be gentlemanly about it. I mean, I think even Luke Hanks and Hadley after that, their, their fight, they they, were, you know, they, they still sputtered their hands afterwards after all their talking. But and there's a genuine yeah. dislike there as well, and they like they yeah, do absolutely. not like each other. No, but there was respect for you know for for what happened over those five rounds. I mean, you know, Luke was like, hey, you know, I, I screwed up in that fight, so uh, you know, he admitted it, moved on. That's the thing as well with that. You, it's a great example of that match because their um, their rivalry. Their deep personal dislike, should we say, that goes back years to to like the amateur ranks. Obviously, Luke discussed it a bit on our show before, where you know where it came from, and 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 we discussed like we we felt like Jake had been maybe a little bit disrespectful to Luke in the build up to Luke's title fight, but you know that's part of the game. Luke had taken it very personally, and obviously stuff from before as well, but. And I think that affected him in the fight, as we discussed. Like he made mistakes because he was so eager to put a beating on Jake that he kept doing this, the wrong things. Um, but at the end of the fight, he still congratulated him. He still, you know, gave mm. him a fist bump or whatever. And like I was always taught, <clears throat> and let's be clear, like I'm not a fighter, I'm not a trainer, I'm nothing to do like in terms of MMA like that. I've never fought in any way like properly, but like. I I was always taught when with football, for instance, like it says more about you with how you lose than how you win. So like you know everyone enjoys winning, blah blah blah. But like even if there's a serious rivalry there, there's a bit of dislike there, whatever it may be. Like you, if you lose, you take it on the chin, you say congratulations, and you get your frustration out somewhere else. Like that's all, the way I was always brought up with every coach, my parents, wherever it may be. Like if you lose, you congratulate your opponent and get on with it. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. You see, you see people distastefully win. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, some people are knocking oh, someone yeah. standing over them, giving them the double fingers. We, we it was the guy all. who did the, uh, I think it was last year, when he beat, he knocked someone out and then he done like a, like a doggy style kind of thing to him as he was like yeah. KO'd oh, on yeah. the floor. Oh, I don't that was. Though, yeah. 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 And there, right, that, yeah, there was yeah. that bit of hatred there, wasn't there? Like, between them two, but yeah. not the best, I suppose. Um, on classless, I want to move on to something else. Uh, Jake Paul seems to be trying to fight anyone and everyone. Obviously, he beat um, that baseball player a couple of weeks back, or well, last week. We talked. We talked about it a bit over the last couple of weeks. Um, he challenged Conor McGregor. Everyone kind of laughed it off. Then he did that video. Um, and I gotta say, like I've got um, a friend who's a football journalist, um, and he's Irish. He lives in America. He was very upset by that video um, by Jake Paul. It's basically like a challenge promo, whatever you want to call it. Um, but he's he kind of calls Connor some names, which you you know you you anticipate that. But he he very much dug into the Irish kind of side of it maybe a little bit of stereotyping and also he went after connor's wife as well a bit but anyway yeah my so my friend he's not happy like he felt that if it was any other culture or race or religion people would be very upset by it but because it's the irish people seem to think it's all right but i'd be interested on kind of your guys take on that but also obviously when he's called out Connor, everyone from people like myself to to people who are like involved in MMA and boxing have just kind of gone, yeah, okay, that's not going to happen because you know Connor McGregor will decimate him in very quick time. Um, and then loads of uh, like UFC fighters have kind of gone, well, I'll have it, I'll fight him. Um, mm -hmm. I think Michael Bispin has been he challenged so Jake Paul challenged Michael Bispin to a boxing match, and Bispin said I think he would be quite interested as you would be but the one which interests me is um amanda nunez 
versus Jake Paul. Now, that's the one I want to see. But I guess, uh, Ben, I'm interested in your take on like the the Jake Paul challenge because he's, he's t- t- I think in the last couple of days, has proved that he's got 50 or somehow got 50 million uh, US dollars to put up for the fight. So he's deadly serious about fighting Conor McGregor. Um, what did you make of the video, first of all, I guess, the challenge? Oh, I think he's a piece of shit. He is. Yeah, bang out order, any man. Like, um, I think if you're going to fight someone, then say whatever the hell you want to to, to them, about them, it's fine. Like, you're going to fight. You know, I don't think anyone can reasonably expect you to be nice. But you 100% don't bring family into it. Shouldn't bring mm-hmm. religion into it. And even race is a, is a, is a funny one. Like, and yeah, but the the family in particular, like if someone ever says anything about my family, then there's no there was no need for it, was there? Pardon? No need for it, was there? Like they was, no, it was so needless. Like, but the thing which, um, like I think is, I think the reason he said that, look, him and his brother have made careers that will be in controversial, and then they'll well, apologize. And then right now, as well, so he's technically yeah. One. But what? Yeah. But that's what they do is they do some in, and they'll apologize afterwards because. They know that the initial controversy is much better than them going about it the right, like the right way, if you like. So if he put out a video just challenging Conor McGregor, people would have gone, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. It would have got some clicks. People would have still watched it, but we wouldn't be talking about it now. It would be gone. But because yeah. he said something, which was bang out of order, we're talking about it. So you are right. Um, but yeah, it's it's a weird one. I gotta say, like. I do wonder if Conor McGregor looks at it and just thinks $50 million, is it just easy money eventually? Like, if Jake Paul keeps running his mouth and saying similar things, will Conor McGregor eventually just go, do you know what, for another, you know, for $100 million again, will I just go and beat the shit over and take the money? I don't know. They'll but, never do it, never made though, will they ever? No, they can't. But this... this that's what they said when, if you remember, when they did the, the run up to the Mayweather fight, people were saying, "Oh, they'll do the boxing," and then Mayweather was saying afterwards, "We'll do MMA." They were never ever gonna do any sort of MMA, um, and there was even rumors in the build up to that, like they might allow Connor to do, like, body kicks but not head kicks to try and even the field. And I was like, they can't. Like, I, I could not explain it. Like. Even if you just allowed a top MMA fighter like Conor McGregor to do leg kicks versus someone who's a box, just a, solely a boxer, or even someone like someone like Jake Paul who's not even a boxer, really, like I can't stress enough how quickly that would be over just from leg kicks. Like Dan, again, like you guys know better than me, like just leg kicks would end it quickly, wouldn't they? Well, I mean, anyone can be taught how to do anything and, you know, as long as you're willing to take on board, you know, what you've got to defend against and putting in the right type of training to, to become effective in defending it. But, you know, there's elements of conditioning yourself as well and that takes time. So, yeah, it's possible to learn how to defend things and try to get yourself effective in that way. But, you know, the fact is some of these lectures are going to get through regardless and, um, and, and you've got to have some form of conditioning because it's, if you ain't conditioned, it's only going to take one that's going to start the, the, mm. the tumble to being you know, kicked off your feet and that's it, you won't be able to stand up properly. So, yeah, and but with the whole, you know, if they, he's just stoking the bee's nest at the end of the day, trying to drum up attention, whether the fight happens or not, he's creating more attention. And, well, do and you know what he did? What is attention based? What he also did is he, um, he went after uh, Dylan Dennis as well, didn't he? He threw some water balloons or something at him. Right. And I just thought, and that's what I mean. I just think if he keeps on with that, I do think Conor McGregor will eventually take that fight. I just think he will because, yeah. one, he likes money, as we, you know, he's proven that over the years. He's a very shrewd businessman, but he's also proven that he's very protective and loyal over the people he cares about. Like, you only have to look at the Khabib thing with um, Artem Lobov. And I just wonder whether eventually he might just say, right, 
let's do it then. I, it will probably a lot of it will probably depend on how the Poirier fight goes. I would say, you know, if he decimates Poirier relatively quickly, he's probably going to be on course for a title fight. So then it might not happen because he's not going to want to mess about with that. If he was to lose to Poirier, then I wonder whether you know it because does it become more app like. Um, appetizing to him if he was to lose to Poirier, Ben, do you think? No. In not terms of easy money? No, I don't want to see anything like that. I don't want to see it, but yeah. I'm just saying to him as a businessman, and you've got this guy running his mouth about your family, your friends, and it's like a lot, a lot of money. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a point where he's got so much money. I think. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, it's a tough one, isn't it? I just, I, I just wish the poor brothers would just. Curl up and die up yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta say, I um, I would love it if they could somehow put on like the freak show fight of Amanda Nunes versus Jake Paul, but I just don't see how it can be done because but, guys, at the end of the day, I just wish they offered me that money to come out of retirement and do it because I would. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it, mate, isn't it? <laughs> it is embarrassing as well, but he's saying just yeah, yeah, it's, it's so. For Man, sure. I'd give him some oil check as well. Miles in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I guarantee you, though, mate, right? Someone, one, that he will fight someone from the UFC in the next year. I just don't know who it's going to be because yeah, I think there's, there's so many fighters now chipping in. Eventually, they're going to find, like, the right mix of it. Like, it's got to be a big enough name. But also, I don't know. I, I just think it will happen because there's so much money on the table, like, at the end of the day. He's got, he's got what he wanted, which is people talking about it. It's getting attention. And, you know, look at us now. We're all talking yeah. about it. If, it, if I was Dana White, I would give him Chimaev. <laughs> That's who I'd give him. In a, but he's got, to, he's got to do it in full MMA rules. I don't think that would be a good idea because you know full well something to be said about his religion and with the way things are in the world that would not be a good uh, idea. Yeah. I tell you what, oh, mate. it's worrying that Nick. Some of these YouTubers and like social media people, they got, they have no morals at all. They'll say no. whatever they oh. say. To get yeah, yeah. And yeah. those two are the worst yeah. for it. Those two are the yeah. worst for it. McGregor himself is a scumbag when it comes to that, isn't it? Some of the stuff he said. Oh, yeah. About Habib is just, yeah, he's as bad as... He crossed the line, didn't he? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be, and, and he came very close to the line with um, Mayweather in the one, pro, uh, you know, they did that like promotional tour where they did like the big press conferences, the two of them. And I think they went to like Ireland, LA and somewhere else. Yeah, and there was one. Was, it? Yeah, it was really cringy. All of them were. But there was one where like, I think he called him boy or something. And it was getting a bit like uncomfortable. Mm. And I just think... I don't know. I don't, I don't want to see it. I, I begrudge talking about it, but there we go. Let's talk about boxing, though. Um, so we had some interesting fights um, last night. You had, um, what do we have? Glofkin. Did, no, Glofkin didn't fight. Yeah. Um, ignore me. Uh, so Canelo. Had Canelo. Sorry, I get confused. Canelo fought um, Callum Smith last night. I know you didn't watch it, Dan. Ben, you did. Um no one's touching Canelo, are they, apart from Golovkin, do you think? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, like, I, I, I really rate Callum Smith. I think Callum Smith's excellent. I thought that Canelo was going to beat him, but I thought there might be initial trouble getting past his, his jab just because he's so long. And mm. I thought that when he did get past his jab, he'd be surprised how good Callum Smith is on the inside because yeah. everyone has said that about him from the start. Like, the, um, the perception is just because he's tall get inside and he's done and his brothers even said they're like that's so far from the case and um, so i know we put a couple of them down with body shots when they spar and they were all just laughing about it <laughs> um so i thought that when canelo got inside there might be a brief phase where he's surprised how good he is on the inside and then he'd figure him out and beat him but he just dominated him didn't he? pretty much from the off yeah yeah and like i saw a lot of people like boxing media people saying he didn't turn up and things like this do you think that's fair to say he didn't turn up, or is it more Canelo is just that good? Um, I reckon it's 80 20 Canelo is okay. that good. Um, although I didn't know until like literally like 20 minutes before we did this, he um, he tore his bicep in with Callum Smith. 
Oh right, okay. Yeah, there's there's a photo and they confirmed that yeah he detached his bicep. Yeah, quite early, like in the third round. Wow, that's uh that's some balls of steel made to to fight a whole fight against the best pound for pound boxer in the world probably. Yeah. Like or one of them at least. Do you know what I mean? Like to do that. And he didn't disgrace himself, like you know, do you know no. what I mean? It wasn't like embarrassing. It it was just a dominant victory. Yeah. And I tell you what as well, Canelo hits fucking hard, I mean, Oh god yeah. Like do you know um, so hard. Even though he struggled to land that clean that often. Because again, Carl Smith's world class, isn't he? But yeah. you're just watching him when he was hitting his guard and you just think, Oh my god, if anything here lands clean, yeah. Callum's gonna be on the moon. So for him to stay in there with that injury is yeah, fair play to him. What um like if you're the boxing matchmakers, who would you match Canelo up against next? To be honest, it's tough, I'm not isn't it? that good with boxing anymore. Mm. Just because of all the bullshit that's with it. Like I'll follow yeah. the champions. Um like I like Billy Joe, just because I think Billy Joe's slick. Yeah. But I think Canelo's kind of I like a couple of years ago he struggled with um Ares Landy Lara and a few people like that, like quite slick movers. But I think he's kind of developed past that now. Um, yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you've got... Like, he's beaten everyone, and the only one who's got any really got close to him is the, the guy he's fought twice already. Mm. And it's where the people want to see that again. But one of boxing's biggest criticisms, of course, is... You know, they don't put on the big fights when the guys are in their peak... Which takes us obviously back to a uh, Joshua and um, Fury. I wanted to ask you, Ben. Obviously, me and Dan we talked about it last week with Brett and before with J- uh, Jack and Richard Shaw. Like, do you think we're going to see Fury and and uh, AJ next year? No, <laughs> me neither. No, I, I don't think it's going to happen. To be honest, I don't really give a shit about it anymore. I, this is what I said to Danny last week, Dan, wasn't it? Like, I'm getting to that point where, like, if they don't do it in maybe the first sort of four months of 2021, I'm probably I just could be like, well, whatever, I don't care anymore. Yeah, like, I, and I, I, watch, um, I didn't watch Joshua versus Bullet just because, again, no. like, I'm kind of over it. And then, but I hear they asked him about Fury and he gave a roundabout answer. Yeah, it's like, no, nah, come on like, now. Oh, get fucked, man. Like, yeah. I I bored like bored of it like because if you're not like it was the same with Mayweather and um, Pacquiao, wasn't it? They never fought each other till they were at the end of their careers. They they dodged mm. that fight. Not to say the fighters dodged it, but for whatever reason they couldn't put it together. And that's that's the biggest problem with boxing is there's so many management companies and you've got DAZN and you've got Eddie Hearn and you've got all the, and then you've got all the different WBC and all this ridiculousness and then you add in the fighters it's so difficult to just to make a match and i think Mm. people want to see the best fight the best and if you're not if you haven't done fury versus aj already it's kind of like well what are we doing you know what's the point like we may as well just put on freak show fights with youtubers and call it what it is yeah because did you know roy jones and um Tyson, they apparently they cleared a million pay per views. Yeah, and like yeah, I see now. That. That's the only thing they give a shit about. Is numbers, yeah, number under pay per view. So, yeah, they'll put on a free show fight because it sells. Um, but then, but then the sport. Yeah, it does because, like, at the end of the day, Fury versus Joshua would smash million views, million pay per view buys easy, yeah. but they won't put it on, and like they're not get like Fury's not getting any younger. And like he's proven time and time again that he is the best boxer, British boxer in the world, best boxer heavyweight in the world. Like yeah. he's got nothing to prove. I feel like it is Joshua who's got something to prove, particularly yeah. when it comes to Fury. Because I don't know, I say it's a weird one, but wish they just get on with it. To be honest, I tell you one thing about normally, like when we have this discussion with people who don't know anything about combat sport or anything, I say, look, it's it's always going to be the promoters making yeah. the fight hard to happen. But I honestly think mm. in this instance, it's Joshua. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, fancy it, does he? I, yeah, I get that sense. Fury's yeah, yeah, being so yeah. vocal, isn't he? It's like, yeah. Yeah, look, money ain't an issue because they're all so stinking rich. So, sorry, that's not really, 
you know, uh, it can be an issue. It could possibly be the management of, of the fighters, I guess. You know, it could be people behind the scenes. Promoters is, is another one. But I, I kind of feel the same that Joshua don't want to put himself on the line. I think sometimes in boxing, uh, in modern times, there's some cowardry there. Yeah. Um, they don't want to put it on the line. You know, and, um, but there is ways to, to dodge each other. And it's it's not like that they need to fight each other for the money because they get paid so handsomely anyway. But in in the MMA community, everyone's you know trying to find a way to earn a decent living and life changing money. So they want to fight the best, you know, all, all times, which is why MMA just growing and growing and growing and has done for for several decades now. And each top fighter wants to get on with another top fighter and find out who's who and and get that payday. But yeah. yeah. I feel like, like one of the worst ones I've ever heard. And I don't want to talk too bad about him because apparently like he's a gentleman when it comes to charities and stuff. But when Amir Khan said he didn't want to fight Kelbrook because he didn't want Kelbrook to get paid. <laughs> yeah. It's just yeah. like, oh, mate, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a strange one, isn't it? Like, obviously, Amir Khan made millions and millions from boxing. But actually, like over the, the latter part of his career, career he hasn't done very well like he's lost a few fights when it's come to the the really big fights in america he's kind of not done that well um but he's made his money um and i mean that you know there was talk about putting him against some of the greats at one point i don't think he's up there to be honest but what can you say like yeah. until boxing until boxing genuinely starts putting on these kind of super super fights of the best versus the best in each division like i just feel like it's not going to be taken it's not going to hit the heights that it once was at least because the one thing which i always say when anyone tries to compare boxing and mma where you'll say like if they're casual fans for instance they'll sort of say oh well you know boxing is more mainstream people know who boxers are or whatever but like that's just because boxing's been around longer. Like yeah. when people get into MMA and they watch it like regularly, they realize that the one thing which MMA does so much better than, not the one thing, but the main thing that they do so much better than boxing is when they've got a super fight to be made or it's the best versus the best, they do it. They don't yeah. fuck about it. They do it and they get it done. It's like, and that's what you've got to do. And that's the point of combat sports, isn't it? Like that, yeah. it's... and I, I tell you what as well. Even um, even like um, quite young professionals, like yeah, Cage Warriors matchups on this last trilogy, like yeah, they were um, both trilogies, mate. They've yeah, like been... there's so many examples. Like one that stood out on my card was um, uh, Nathan Fletcher and I think it's Lee Mitchell. Hmm. Like those two fighting early. Me and me and Crawford to be fair, like dangerous fight for both. Um, I can't say his last name, but. Your boy Jordan, Danny, and Paul. Jordan Vucinic. Like, there's so many fights where you're watching them, you're like, fuck me, this is, this is to go either way. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, when we did the show with Richard and Jack, it was the week before Cage Warriors down, wasn't it? And um, we That's did it. all the predictions. And when we actually went through fight by fight, there were so many fights where you were like, yeah, it could go either way. Mm. And they were genuinely like, that. They, but they're the fights people want to see. They're, you know, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? We don't want to see Jordan fight like a nobody who he's going to crush in 20 seconds or Paul Hughes fight just some guy who's, you know, one wins, one loses, one constantly. We want to see him fight someone who's going to, like, they're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe for three rounds and it could go either way. Um, it's yeah, so a, a lot of that can be, you know, you know, something's got to be said really for Ian Dean. You know, he's the yeah. matchmaker. You know, he does put up some awesome, awesome matches. Yeah. He really, really does. But you've got to commend the fighters because they, they agreed to do it. You know, they're, they're willing to always put it on the line. They're, the, they're fighters, true to the heart, they really are. And, um, you know, they're, they're all in it to win it. But, you know, obviously the consequence in any potential, potential fight is that you could lose. But they're willing to put it on the line to find out, hey, you know, could see what's Who's the best? Who's not? That's what I love about the uh, MMA community. There's no hiding behind anything. Yeah, they just they just put it out there. You gotta love it. Because like you see, it like now in the UFC, like the top, even like the top fifteen, 
anyone can beat anyone. Like yeah. a phantom weight. What have you got? You got um, Marais knocked out Aljamain Sterling. Aljamain finished Sandhagen, but then Sandhagen yeah. finished Marais. Yeah. yeah, and it's just like you are three beasts. You they could fight a hundred times, and it could be like yeah. fifty-one forty-nine. Mm. But yeah. it shows the shows the character of the fighters that they're willing to do it. I find it so ironic that when MMA started off, the boxing community was saying that it's barbaric. But then yeah. they, they have no issue sending somebody out there when he's going to get knocked out one hundred percent. Yeah, and mm. then at least in the cage, it's say it's fifty-fifty. Yeah, well, bo- boxing putting in basically amateurs against professionals, isn't it? Like, say yeah. what you will about Conor McGregor, like he's not an amateur in terms of fighting, but like he had no boxing experience, and they had no problem putting him up against the probably the best boxer of all time. Now, I'm not saying it's the same as putting you know like a YouTube star in against um, Floyd Mayweather, which is ironically that is what we didn't even touch on that Logan Paul's fighting Floyd Mayweather. Like, to me, that's ridiculous. Um, but, like, you'd never see, you wouldn't see that in MMA because the best fight the best constantly. And it's like an interchanging thing, isn't it? Whereby you're constantly striving to find out who is the best. So, if you come in, for, for instance, like Mason Jones, Jack Shaw, guys like this who have gone into the UFC over the last few years, they. You know, they've destroyed everyone in their path in Europe. They've gone over to the UFC, the biggest company in the world. They don't just jump straight to the title picture. They have to they have to start again and they have to fight their way through the division, up into the rankings, through the rankings to get a title shot. Now boxing doesn't do that and I think it hurts the the way people view it. Yeah. Ultimately. The, the, the worrying thing is though. Like we saw it with boxing, MMA, the promotion will get, sorry, the other promotions other than the UFC will get bigger. Their monopoly will get less and less to the point where mm. MMA will be exactly like boxing. Yeah, that's, and, that is a problem, isn't it? Yeah, but like then, it's already happened with boxing, so there's no reason why it won't happen again with MMA. Yeah, let's just hope that the uh, MMA fighters get as played as much as the boxing at some point. Yeah, that's the whole yeah, thing. That's yeah, my, uh, that's my big argument. beef with them. Um, I can't remember. It, it, it was a top MMA promoter. I'm sorry, one of the top boxing promoters. He's an old fella now. But I know that he was going toe-to-toe on Twitter or, or on some kind of social media with uh, Dana White. And, and uh, you know, the boxing promoter was right. He said, you know, 80% of all the money revenue goes to the fighters. Where statistically in MMA, maximum 20% of any proceedings go to the fighters. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. absolutely you know, the opposite way around. And, you know, I do still feel that the MMA fighters are not getting paid their worth. Okay, you can become a wealthy man or wealthy woman, you know, at the top of your game, but that's the few at the top. Um, there's many, many boxers making a, a, a very, very good living that are not always in the limelight at the very, very top. They're still earning a lot more than the uh, MMA guys and girls are. So, yeah, but maybe in the future things will slowly change. Yeah, but then you know, if it gets that way, maybe Emma may start you know, avoiding each other, and we'll have the same issue in Emma May as we have boxing. But let's hope that never happens. That's what I think. Yeah, again, I think I don't think it'll be the fighters in Emma it'll be the promoters. Yeah, yeah, they're the ones that cause the, the, the issues. Yeah. They just like it's so early days, so I think it's going to be say like probably another 10 years before it happens mm. in Emma But I, I think in, with Bella at all now with um, she show Pitbull. No, oh, it frustrates me. They do the bro- yeah, two yeah. of them. Oh, do they? <laughs> the I brothers, yeah. I think Patricio could be the best featherweight in the world from any promotion. Okay, but we were not going to see it. Mm. Yeah, because you're not going to. Mm. They will cross matter, over. Yeah, for there's more and more champions from different promotions, and again, you're not going to see it. And then before you know it, it's boxing. Yeah. 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 I guess. I think. Um, I gotta say, I do. We talked about Bellator a lot over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, we had Brett on last week as well. Um, but like we've talked about, or I've talked about, damn my frustration with their obsession with kind of signing older fighters instead of focusing on like the young fighters coming up who could be the next big thing. And I do think they. I don't want to kind of go into it all over again and repeat myself. 
they do seem to be slowly changing that in terms of like if you look at some of the fighters they've signed more recently it looks like a bit more like they're starting to go that way but for for years it was kind of like rampage jackson was out there at 50 something and i don't know it frustrates me but there we go um what did you make a ufc last night then guys just overall um danny you first what overall yeah. were your thoughts yeah, I, I really enjoyed the fights. It, you know, okay, so there's slightly less finishes than some previous weeks that we've been reviewing, but um, some really interesting in fights, nevertheless. So I, I really enjoyed watching them. What about you, uh, Ben? Do you enjoy the show, mate? Yeah, same. To, to be fair to them, it's it's always good. If, if I was them, I wouldn't even so much be from trying to promote the fighters so much. It would just be the fact that if you tune into any UFC, and if it's going to be a good fight like nine times out of ten yeah it's been phenomenal this year like when you factor in covid and stuff um like the ufc has put on some absolutely phenomenal really unbelievable fights um this year and cards and then when you factor in covid and the difficulties around it the amount of shows they've put on i think like for me personally and like i'm sure like danny you'll agree like being able to do this podcast every week and talk about fights has helped get through what has been a real shitty year because, you know, as much as like we had a lot of fun doing those retro reviews, Dan, it was wicked. Like I really enjoyed it yeah. and I'm looking, looking forward to, you know, we'll, we might pop back to them now because there's no UFC for, I think, till the 16th. So we might do a few more of them over the next couple yeah. of weeks. Like it was a lot of fun, but there's nothing like covering boxing, wrestling, um, MMA every week and I, like UFC I think can cage warriors Bellator they all deserve massive credit for mm. finding a way to put on shows yeah I remember it didn't seem that long ago when you know UFC was you know so much more fewer times on and it would be such a massive talking point because yeah. there, there would only be a certain amount per year but now they're practically every week and yeah, so it makes it less of a talking point. Of course, you get your, your, your odd matchups that do create so much attention. But um, some of the weeks can roll by where people ain't really talking about it in the gym because it's, you know, just a big week. I mean, we're in the line of business of covering them each week. So we have an added interest each time. But, uh, yeah, it's amazing that we've been on every single week. Uh, but I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I, I love doing the MMA. I, I love participating in it as a coach. And I love reviewing it as a fan. Yes, indeed. So, well, let's get into it. Um, the pre the prelims, like we're we're going to focus on the main card. Um, but I will say there was one fight on the prelims, particular well, the finish of it, which really kind of caught my eye. But also, um, the two female fights I thought were pretty good um, on the the prelims. Um, so, first of all, Dan, we'll talk about. Uh, I know you had a quick look at the finish. Jimmy Flick got a, um, he, he took home fifty grand for his uh, flying triangle uh, finish on Corey Durden. But uh, what did you think of the finish to that, my friend? Yeah, I mean, how sweet. Um, everyone likes to add to it to that highlight reel, um, but most of them come in the form of um, a knockout. But yeah. to, to yeah. get to get a submission from the feet is pretty rare in MMA. Pretty damn rare. But I think it, you know, um, went in combination with that head kick that he landed. I think it just flustered his opponent just enough so that when he jumped it, he was able to keep the positive down. I think maybe if he just jumped it with a, a fresh head, opponent, maybe that wouldn't have pulled off quite as we saw it. But um, I do think that, that that head kick may have added to, to the whole sequence that allowed it to finish the way we saw it. Because he did kind of stay down low with his posture. London, and you really should when someone just jumped it in because to find that triangle when you're jumping it is not mm. on in the feet as you go down. You normally link your ankles into a triangle holding position, uh, which is with your ankles, and then you button in behind your knee. Um, okay. So there is, there is room to escape it. You really shouldn't be getting caught with jumping triangles, but I just think he was slightly busted by that, that head kick, although it wasn't hugely consequential in knocking him out or knocking him down. Um, it just seemed to stun him somewhat and made him stay down low with that posture, which yeah, led to his demise in that one. But yeah, great. I mean, what a highlight to have. Brilliant. 
Ever done flying triangle there, uh, Ben? No, I won't like me. I don't think that's in the uh, that's in the toolbox. <laughs> I think I'd more likely knock myself out. <laughs> 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 I got little crab legs. They don't like going up high like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, ben, I, I'm assuming because you're like a machine when it comes to watching fighting, you watch everything, didn't you? So I'm assuming I'm going to assume that you watched all the prelims. What um, what did you make of the Talia Santos? No, which one was it? Uh, the Soraya Eubanks versus Pani Kinzad uh, fight. I thought that was a real good fight. I thought I'm going to let you down here and I'm going to no, get told no. off. The girls were on and I can't lie, I didn't pay as much attention on the girls. Oh, I mate. Know. Oh, my God, Ben Ellis. You're never going to hear from me again. <laughs> get lynched by You're a hot bloody man. We should be standing up for attention when the women are on. So, no, yeah, they, um, I didn't pay that much attention if I'm being honest. Yeah. The, the blokes, the blokes I got. I know yeah. What <laughs> All right, and so I got to say, the I, the Pani uh, Kinzad versus Shariah Eubanks, uh, I thought was a phenomenal fight, and I really think that's one. It's a massive win for Kinzad, but also um, we've been treated to the female fights this year have been absolute on another level. To say women's MMA has gone up a level this year, I think wouldn't be doing it enough justice. Like, been absolutely phenomenal. And in my opinion, the best fight of the year is still, um, I always Warren, forget. Maybe, yeah. yeah, I just mm. thought that was so good. So good. Um, Danny, I would say to you, because I know you enjoy the, the, the women fights, I would watch the Pani Kinzad Shiraya Eubanks was the one I'd pick out to watch, mate. Um, I think you'd okay, enjoy yeah. that one. Um, one All right, then, Ben. I will say, uh, apart from the Jimmy Flick fight, pick one of the prelims that you really enjoyed. Let me, uh, let me get the, uh, get the What part. about the Anthony Anthony Pettis one? Say, let's say that one because Danny watched that. Oh yeah, yeah. I, like I gotta give. Uh, I say I know we're gonna talk about the Pettis one. I did enjoy the um, the Ron Win fight as well. Okay. He's such an anomaly being five six at middleweight. Um, yeah. yeah. He's a fast down to Pettis. I love Pettis. They're good. Story it's a weird one. So, after the fight, um, it's been announced. Andy Pettis is a free agent um, heading into 2021. He was asked about it at the press conference. He said, you know, it was a risk taking this fight without re-signing his contract. Usually, he signs a three fights or two fight deal, but uh, he's 33. Um, He's been with the company 11 and a half years. Um, So he's decided, you know, he obviously must have signed a contract for this fight, but like he didn't sign anything after that. He said he doesn't feel like his job's at stake. He thinks he's earned the right to fight, you know, where he is and he can fight with the best of them. Uh, He's on a two fight winning streak now because he beat Cerrone in May and then he uh, beat Alex Moreno on Saturday night. But uh, he... He thinks he's got leverage on uh, the UFC. I'd be interested to see what you guys think. But first of all, the fight. Dan, what did you make of it? Yeah, really good. I mean, he had a little bit of a sticky start, didn't he? Um, mm. But Dan Marino uh, performed amazingly um, just a couple of months back. Um, really, really impressive. You know, he can come in full on with his hands because he's got such good wrestling. And, and that's quite a difficult style because he's kind of smothered you. He just keeps pressing forward and got the cardio to back it up as well. Um, yeah, uh, Pet did slip with a kick, didn't he? And he got himself in a little bit of a tricky situation. Kind of like just didn't get things going too great in that first round. But his adaptation to his striking, which is really his skill set, isn't it? He's a little hard to read. Um, he's got really good kicks, really good hands. Um, he can switch and fight well both both ways, which can be confusing for some guys. And I think that's what really edged it for him over those next two rounds, is the fact that he switched up his stance and switched up his attacks. He was throwing those kicks and spinning kicks, and that one rocked tomorrow. It was really, really impressive. Um, yeah, what, he really just showed his experience. That's the only thing I can really say. So really so you're right, he's got to his goal. But he had to dig deep in that fight, and he did dig deep, deep um, but he kept his fantasy with that, and then uh, he kept himself really hard to read, and I think that's really what's the key to his success. A really great performance, really. Yeah, I think so. Uh, ben, what did you make of this one? Yeah, to be honest, the, the exact same as Danny. I thought Pettis' pound of right hand in particular was something we haven't seen too much of. Because in the past, he's always been 
just trying to create space for his legs. So everyone knew he just run it in. It might be one of their own body. But then then you're in a clinch with him, it's not so bad. But in the second round in particular, he was just stepping back, ping in the right hand. Then as soon as he created that bit of hesitation on Moreno, it let it let it, it let his legs go and everybody knows what a dangerous kick he is in all fairness to him. And obviously when he when he caught him with that hook kick in the third. It's, mm. I can see what you're saying about having leverage because when Anthony Pettis is fighting, everyone's going to tune in to watch because everyone loves the spinning stuff. Yeah. Um, he just frustrates me because he's just a, he's a typical low percentage guy where he'd always go for the low percentage stuff. He's really good mm. at it. So it's, for him, it might not be as low percentage as somebody else. But like that finish, he's he's dropping, dropping to his back for a guillotine. It's like, mate, you've just mm. hit him in the head. Just keep hitting him. Um, mm. But then again, he's pulled stuff like that off so much, then, yeah, he's, he can do what he wants. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one, though, um, for him to come out with a few, you know, as a free agent. It's not uh, the usual way they do things, the UFC. You know, they normally like to have their fighters tied up or not. Um, yeah. And obviously, we had Brett on last week, and he discussed how his contract was up. UFC came to him, and they... He, you know, they the offer they made him was not what he was expecting, not the number he had in mind. So he went and uh, had a look at his other options. Bellator came in with a fantastic offer, and he was he took it. And that's the risk they run now with Anthony Pettis because if I'm Bellator, I want Anthony Pettis. I've got to say, yeah. like, um, so I just think you know if they're picking up Brett, they picked up. Um, Namega Namega Madoff, they've picked up um, Corey Anderson. I'd have Anthony Pettis if I was them, so it'll be interesting because if UFC doesn't make him a good offer, like he's been there eleven and a half years, the fact he's let that run down to become a free agent tells me that he's open at least to hearing what other companies have got to say. If that makes sense, yeah. Dan, it, do you it, think? It really oh, Ben, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, go on. Go on, no, I would go say on, it really on. surprises me that more fighters don't test free agency. Yeah. Because their whole basis of not testing it is the fact that they want to know they've got a contract. So it's like, okay, great. Say they've got a four-fight deal. They re-sign after two fights. But there's no security on the contract anyway because you can get terminated at any point. So yeah. why the fuck wouldn't you just play the contract out and then literally, you can do it on Twitter, at one championship, yeah. at Bellator, at UFC, I am a free agent, who's saying what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, it's like anything in it, that's how you get your money's worth, by creating a bit more. Like, that's what Eddie Alvarez used to do. Yeah. And that's the reason he caught in so many promotions, and then they all say how much he got paid in comparison to others. I, yeah, I don't understand it. That's, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. If, like, if I'm him, like, he's obviously, he's talked about it, in the the post fight press conference, but like if I was him, I agree. He's thirty three, so like this is probably going to be his last big contract, isn't it? Like being realistic, mm-hmm. if he signs Where a three or, three or four fight deal with anyone, that's probably going to be his last big contract. So why wouldn't you say you know, tweet them all, tell them all, who wants yeah, me? Literally, I mean, yeah, especially him because. He's only 33, but... Exciting fighter, isn't he? He's had a busy 33, and he was fighting yeah, God, yeah. in the UFC from a young age. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I mean, I think, what was it? DC made his UFC debut at, like, 32. But then he yeah, had the cool. same impact that Pettis or somebody who's been doing MMA for 10 years has. So it's yeah. all relative to the individual in it. But, yeah, for him, I would say he's a pretty... Well, he's got a fair few miles in the park. Yeah, he, um, so he like he made his debut for the UFC in 2010, um, but he fought in WEC before that for a couple of years. So like he has been, you know, he's been a busy fighter. There hasn't been a year where he hasn't fought like a couple of times at least. Yeah. And like you know, he's fought like Ferguson. He's fought. Um, he was supposed to fight Chiesa because of, uh, but they got called off because of the. The Dolly incident. Um, so, like, he's. Uh, yeah. I'd be amazed if Bellator f- and one championship weren't interested in him. Right. Let's get into the um, 
the busyness of the main card. Very, uh, very interesting, very exciting. What was the first fight on the main card? The heavyweights. Uh, Marcin Tybura versus the ever-popular Greg Hardy. Um, if you listen to Michael Bisping in the first round, you'd think Greg Hardy was on his way to a title shot. And uh, he has really sorted out. He did look better, in my opinion, than he has. Than he, and that's the one thing I'd say about Greg Hardy, is with every fight in the UFC, he's looked a better fighter. But when he was taken to the ground, he just did not have a clue what to do to get out of uh, those positions. And equally, he, because he's had so many short fights, like the first round, he looked good, sharp, punchy, but he was done. Like, he was gassed, gassed after that first round. Um, ben, you go first, mate. What did you make of this fight overall? I am, um, I'm not his biggest fan, I won't lie. No, me neither. They're just, they're, he's one of those guys, something always goes on, like just the, the inhaler, the DQs, there's so many examples. Um, and yeah, so my main takeaway is you see him on the deck and you're like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Mm. So, like, what are, you, what are you doing in the UFC? You arguably shouldn't be there. Um, mm. but you're there because you're high profile and people will tune in to watch you. But yeah, I was surprised. He was a favorite one. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. Yeah, and me yeah. neither. My me neither. On. I can't say the other guy's name, but again, he's Tybura. Known as, yeah, he's known as a fresh, a, a bit of grappler, and so it's just like mm. if he takes him down, it's arguably going to be done. And then obviously it was. Yeah, it was weird. Like the first round, Greg Hardy looked good in that first round. I got to say, like better than I've seen him look. He looked sharp. His punching was sharp. Everything just looked on point. But then he came out for that second round, and like if you watched the. Uh, so, you know, like in between the rounds, there was a guy trying to clean up his nose and he was just pushing him away because he didn't want him to do it. But he wasn't speaking because he was so out of breath that like he was just like just going like that and he wasn't speaking. He could really struggle and like really gasping for breath. Now, you know, I'm not saying anything like about fighters. Don't get me wrong. Like I admire everything they do, but like you should be able to do like three rounds as a professional fighter and he can't seem to get past that one like the when he does one more than is one or two minutes of knockout he seems to empty the gas tank quickly um danny what do you make of this one mate yeah he impressed me more than any other you know, because his striker did look so sharp um i mean at one point he was lining up to bora landing what five consecutive cross hands actually mm. looked really dire for Tibor at one at one point um, but Tabura, I've, you know, I've seen him fight numerous times. I'm, I'm actually quite a fan of his style. Um, it, you know, he toughed out. He's a real tough dude. You know, he's not going to back down just because he gets a a few hard shots. He's coming right back at you. But I really like the fact that he showed through his experience because in, in that second round, he started uh, changing it up, started to try to smother Hardy's game and try and push him at a harder, faster pace. Because standing on the outside, Hardy was looking really effective and sharp, and it w he was looking impressive. It's hard to argue that. And um, well, just struggled to take him down for the first two entries and the first two attempts that he, he tried. But when he did get him down, man, yeah, it, uh, Hardy showed a big, big hole in his game. I mean, like I say, he did defend the takedown a little bit, you know. So you know, he's obviously making some kind of improvements in, in his wrestling defence. But the ground, it seems that he was so clueless that. He just seemed fearful to be there. He curled up. He wasn't doing the right things with his arms. He wasn't framing on the floor to try to get himself up off the mat and, and digging an under pummel. He wasn't doing any of that. He literally just, just curled up um, and just gave it all away. But I do think his weight is an issue as well. Um, he was right on the limit, wasn't he? He was cutting weight to, yeah. to make weight. Um, so that could be said for maybe his lack of condition training. I mean, a lot of these top athletes now, they have someone doing their diets they doing their, their strength and conditioning program um maybe you should perhaps be concentrating on that alongside trying to learn the full spectrum of mma but clearly the ground is an issue and uh yeah he's got to address that if he wants to make any further impacts in mma because other fighters are going to see that and they're going to be like hey you know he's learning his striking craft well let's get this guy down on his back where clearly he hasn't got a clue what he's doing yeah, so we, the other thing as well, mate, is, um, he, so he's lost twice in the UFC, um, 
and it's been both times he's come up against someone who's got anything about him. Like, mm. that to me is a worry if I'm Dana White or whoever, you know, who think he's the going to be their sort of cash cow because... You know, they've put him up against various different fighters. He's destroyed them, knocked them out, blah, blah, blah. But every time he's fought... So he lost last night against uh, Tybora, who's a very, very good fighter. And I think he deserves... You know, even though he lost, um, even though Greg Hardy lost, we're still kind of focusing on him. I thought Tybora was excellent, and he's been yeah. very impressive in the UFC. Um so yeah, uh, Volkov was the other person that um, Greg Hardy lost to, and he obviously lost his first fight versus, or one of his early fights versus uh, no, his first fight versus Alan Crowder, but that was down to he got himself disqualified if you remember to an illegal mm. knee, which goes to what you were saying, Ben, about like there's always something. So he's had like one fight overturned. He's had a fight where he was disqualified. And that's before you even talk about some of the other stuff outside of the cage. But yeah, yeah I thought Tybura was very good. Um, and I was amazed that uh, Greg Hardy was the favourite. Um, so next up was a fight. This was the sleeper. This was the one I was really looking forward to. And uh, it only went around. even Not even around. Marlon uh, Marais versus Rob Font. I felt like this was where we were going to finally see uh, Marlon's ground game because he hasn't really showcased it very much considering how high level he is. And um, Rob Font has been impressive, I think it's fair to say, these uh, last couple of fights. What did you make of this one? Danny, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, I mean, it all started well, didn't it? He, he shot in, got Font down. It, it was looking good. But one thing I've noticed about Marais is that he, he has a bit of a suspect chin. Um, mm. He's got suspect cardio as well. Um, so maybe he was choo choosing to get to the round, try and create some, some kind of early finish opportunities there. But, uh, yeah, he was looking impressive. But I mean, he was scrambling back up. He was making his hands land very, very early. And um, once he the sense, you know, or a taste of blood, so to speak, he, he was just mm. on it for the finish. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've not been impressed with my, for, for, I think I've said to you in previous uh, podcasts, I've not been impressed with him of late. He just doesn't seem to strategize his game well. He's got great leg kicks. He can clearly wrestle and can clearly grapple. He just is not putting it in the correct unison. And, yeah, he, he keeps on uh, letting his opponent in and finding a way to, to, to beat him. And uh, sometimes I feel like he's not letting... The opponents find a way to win. He's kind of giving them all the win somewhat, and I've kind of lost faith in him stringing together any kind of considerable winning streak anymore. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, obviously, Marias is high level in various parts of his game, but he's just having some some issues maybe with confidence. But I agree with you, like you've mentioned before, Dan. His chin is a bit suspect, and he started well and got caught. What did you think of Rob Font's performance, uh, Ben? I just thought it was really good. Because um, I was picking Marais to win. Um, they come out, Marais blasted a few kicks. So obviously, his kicks are incredible. He's, like, mm. he's got to look up there with one of the best kickers in the UFC. I agree. Um, yeah. So he, he took his days, he got taken down. Um, which was a great read by Marais. Because obviously, Font was so quick to get inside kicking range. He was jumping in, so the level changed there for Marais' happy days. Um, yeah. But you know, you know when some people just seem to be like working too hard, like he's on top of Rob Font and he looks so stiff for a black belt. Mm. I'm like, well, I say Font got up a couple of times and before you know it, I thought he got tired. And then I think it was a jab that rocked him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think he probably does cut too much weight. And then just say something about it where, like you said, Danny, like he doesn't flow the martial arts particularly well. Mm. Um, because I thought, yeah, in the grappling, that's stiff. Yeah, it's weird that is because he's. Um, I think he, I think he's, I'm sure that I haven't got it up in front of me now. I'm sure he's like a black belt in. Yeah, yes, he's very and stuff. Isn't he? Yeah, but, but he did. We like, haven't really seen that though eh, in you, his fights, have we? Not no, really, no. But you know, Ben picked up on a really good point. He did look stiff, and he, he, the way it looked to me, he was trying to grapple as if he had the gear on, and. Um, 
yeah, it, it just doesn't suit MMA to do that. And um, yeah, I mean, but you know, come on, Funk got up really, really well. He risked, he wrestled the risk really well when he stood up. And if you see on one of the stand ups, he wrestled the risk and then switched to the other risk as he come up. So. You know, he'd he done really, really well the way he got up back up to the feet. Um, you know, it wasn't all just because Morass was, was performing badly. Funk was performing very, very well. Um, yeah, I just don't know where Morass goes from here now because he's another one now that's been around for a while and his results have not been, been great of late. Um, I'm not too sure where he's going to go, really. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder what's next for him because he looked... Uh, I They... Did like a shot of him after the finish of the fight, and he just um, he looked like done. Like, mm. just you know, when someone just looks mentally exhausted, like mm. he looked just like he was staring up at the sky, and the, the the doctor was like checking on him, and he said, "No, I'm fine." So it wasn't like he was like knocked out cold or something. He was just kind of staring off blankly, as if he was just didn't quite know what to make of it. Um, mm. Another fight which I was really looking forward to because I just did not know how it was going to go, was Michelle Pereira versus Chaos Williams. Chaos Williams has uh, been impressive, I think it's fair to say. Like, he's uh, on a good run, knocking people out. Michelle Pereira is massive for the weight division and is so so skillful. Um, so I was very interested to see how this was going. Pereira picked up the victory via unanimous decision, 29-28, across the boards. Ben, what did you make of this one, mate? See, I, I think Pereira is outstanding. And mm. because he's such a weird bloke, he takes away from his own <laughs> ability. Because yeah. everyone's talking about the weird stuff he's doing. Nobody's talking about... He's, he's really good. Um, like, not just his athleticism, his kicks. Um, he's, he's defensively he's harder to hit than he looks. Everyone says he's easy to hit because his hands are down by his side. But he's not. Um, I give Chaos his respect as well when it wasn't going his way yeah, a couple of times and basically just charged Pereira mm. like I got I got a lot of time for that if it's not going your way and you're willing to go out on your shield trying to get the win happy days I mean obviously I know Pereira didn't didn't pull him out but he very easily cut up the way Chaos was running at him mm. um, but yeah I thought I thought it was a good fight and then interesting to see Pereira take him down in the third as well um so yeah, no, it was a really, really good fight. Like I say, going into it, I didn't have a clue what was going to happen. I really didn't have a clue. Yeah, it was a weird one, wasn't it? He just did not know what was going to happen. Um, Danny, what did you make of this one, mate? Yeah, um, I mean, Pereira wasn't able to put on his full displays that we've seen in some other matches that we've, we've, we've watched with him. Um, I, I suppose this chaos, is, you know, he, he can press forward quite well, given the opportunity. It did look like Chaos was struggling a little bit to try to get in to make Wayne happen other than to do the flurries. I think his flurries would have looked more technically clean and would have had more success if he learns to do combination while you're stepping your stance forward. So what I mean is if your left leg forward, you're throwing a combination. Why don't you throw your combination staying left leg forward? Throw your combinations actually make steps forward with your right leg and switch your stance in and transition as you're throwing your combinations. <clears throat> because, you know, being that you're in a cage, it's quite a large area anyway. Um, but Pierre has got such good rangy striking and footwork. You're going to have to put into your striking if you want to be successful with your striking ways of covering that distance as you're throwing. And I felt like he was trying to, uh, just staying too traditional with his starts, and that's just too much of a stiff start to, to make it tactical if you want to wish to look at it. So I just felt it made him look a little bit weird and a bit stuck in the mud compared to Pereira. Um, I would have loved to see Chaos do. I imagine if I was becoming a fan of Chaos's game, I really like the way he fights, but this style, this type of opponent just didn't fall well for him unless he was willing to make uh, adaptive changes um, in preparation for this guy. I think he's got all the skill set to win, he just needs to change up those combinations a little bit to learn to be able to cover that extra distance and range against those those footwork oriented strikers that are so so long as well. Um but Pereira, yeah, he's he's on a roll now. He's doing it so well and I think he used a really deal uh, looks so muscular at the way. And um you now I don't mean to create suspicion for anyone, but you look how muscular some of these provisions are, it makes you wonder what's going on. Um did you see how muscled Jeffrey Elder was? I mean they're very, very similar physique. 
massively muscled um, across their back, really rounded on the top of their arms. And it looks like they're wearing a backpack because of their traps that are sticking up so hard. Um, yeah, I mean, how are they doing that? Um, but it seems to be just the Bavillians. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I don't need to put any doubts in now. I don't want to point the finger, but it does make me wonder sometimes. But, yeah, it, impressive. He's still winning, right? Yeah, man. This, uh, yeah, uh, well, I'll leave that one out there for, for people to speculate, Dan. You can uh, you can start the rumours, mate. Yeah, um, I mean, not, not, not so. I don't mean to do it that way, but uh, physically, the, the, they just yeah, they incredibly look incredibly muscle, un incredibly unbelievable, don't they? I've never seen Jose Aldo look like that. I gotta say, he looked in phenomenal mm. shape. Um, yeah, yeah. There's uh, people. I saw some people saying, "Oh, Chaos Williams, like he's, you know, he's he was a flash in the pan or whatever." But you know, Michelle Pereira is a phenomenal fighter. Um, and I don't think Chaos Williams was embarrassed in any way. So no, no, know, I, I think, think um, who do you draft in as a training partner for for this style of guy? Mm -hmm. he, he's so unique, and that's the difficulty. You're having to kind of learn on the job. You kind of have to guesswork what kind of you know combinations might work and, and what kind of game plan you want to make to work on him. But you know, to make it all fit and work in real life, you're kind of having to learn to do that on the job. Um, I think Chaos Williams done pretty well considering and um but i'm sure if they ever go to place again which is an absolute possibility with you look at their young ages um i think Curtis williams will be coming with a slightly different game plan to be more effective next time um but well done to Pereira. you know i love watching him fight you never know what you're going to get with him he's uh he's definitely flamboyant and definitely shiny to watch yeah 100 percent. um ben i know you've got to shoot mate um quarter past so um very very quickly just get your thoughts on the the jose aldo marlon vera fight um i i thought aldo looked really good i i agree with you as well dan he looked in mental shape mm. um it's just nuts in it the, the question with aldo all the time is why on earth aren't you leg kicking yeah, um, yeah. i know he kicked a little bit in this fight and pretty much every time he did he was super successful mm. but he just doesn't do very much of it um but yeah, I, I think he's really good. He, he suffers from that thing where, up until this fight, everyone he fights is a number one contender or champion. Um, mm. So it's so easy to say that he's not this and he's not that. He's fighting monsters. Um, mm. And then every time we see him fight someone who's a monster, but maybe said, you know, mid ranking, like fifth or sixth, like Jeremy Stevens, Moicano, he smashes them. Mm. Um, so he, he's really good in fairness to him. He really is. I thought he looked good. Uh, yeah, it was it was really interesting, mate. Danny, just before we get your thoughts on it, we'll uh, say uh, goodbye to Ben because I know he's got to go. Ben, thank you for joining us, mate. It's uh, always a pleasure yeah. and uh, you're always welcome. Yeah, well done on your win, Ben. It. Yeah, well done on your win and I look forward to seeing you fight in the very near future. I'm sure we're going to have a, a bang in 2021. And um, thanks for coming on. Uh, cheers, guys. All the best. Yeah, top yeah, man. Cheers, cheers Ben. Buddy. So, let's uh, finish this off with these last couple. So, yeah, what did you make of um, Jose Aldo and Vera? Unanimous decision in Aldo's favour, 29-28 again across the board. What did you make of Vera? Yeah, I mean, he, he absolutely won that fight. It was nice to see him kicking and being effective. Um, uh, yeah, looked a little bit like Jose Aldo of, of old. And, you know, what, what Ben is saying, it's kind of true, really. I think we saw him dominate over a decade so, so convincingly that maybe we're seeing him lose against the top, top level guys. Maybe we are being a bit too harsh on him and writing him off a little bit sooner than we should. Maybe, maybe so. I think it's partly because he's come away from the kicking game. He seems to be trying to work his hands more in the fights. And, you know, maybe this is a skill set that's slowly evolving and he's looking to add to the kicking game. And, and it looked like it. You know, last night he put his hands and his legs together very, very well. And something else that we don't normally see of him, that for him to choose to engage in that one. And he put him and got to the back very, very quickly in that final round. And, you know, this guy's an extremely good grappler as well. We just don't see any of it because he's such an accomplished striker and he uses his striking as his main weapon and main tool. But he has very, very good grappling. And he demonstrated it with great control of there. Um, very did very, very well as well. He always looked relevant, always looked dangerous in there. But when Jose Aldo's on form 
and he's back to his old ways. No one could beat him for nearly a decade. So, yeah, he, he done well to hang in there as long as he did and as well as he did. When um, Chris Elders looking so, so good and sharp as we saw him Saturday night. Yeah, 100%, mate. And the main event was Stephen Thompson versus Jeff Neal, with Stephen Thompson picking up the victory. Unanimous decision, 50-45 across the boards. What did you make of this for a main event? Wow, you know, five rounds of that kind of style of striking the Thompson wins, which is, you know, a lot of bouncing on spot, a lot of zigzagging with the footwork uh, because he chooses to have a low guard, a no guard at all the times. Um, really impressive footwork. Uh, really impressive selection of striking. Um, and Jeff Neal is really good. He really is. And mm. only time he could have switched that fight around very, very quickly. I think it was a case of if it goes the distance, Thompson was nearly always going to win. He was always going to have a bigger output of strikes and more precise to strike. He, he fights long and also learns to fight pretty damn well in close as well for the brief times that he has to fight in close. He does very well there. But Jeff O'Neill stayed so hard under that barrage of striking from the outside game that Thompson was bringing. I mean, he was getting getting caught through the guard occasionally, you know, really nice and clean. He stayed so, so poor, but I think sometimes a little bit too poor. I think a little bit more urgency to shut down or keep the pace on that aging Thompson would have seen a possible different result and maybe more opportunities to win over those final championship rounds over those round four and five. Um, Jeff and I feel like we're strategizing a little bit different. Again, we're not in there. It's not up there, up there against someone like Thompson. It's totally big into your face and body. Um, but going back on to Thompson, really, really amazing. The guy's 37 years old and in incredible shape. He still strategizes his game extremely well. And the output was utterly impressive. And both of them were banged up. They had a nasty head clash, didn't they? Um, yes, yeah. Look how gentlemen they were. I mean, we do love it when there's a rivalry and the borderline hatred for each other. It does come up some interest, but what an enjoyable match of respect. You know, they were looking out mm. for each other from the touch field. And Jeff and Neil could have really taken a chance at uh, you know, taking advantage of Thompson when Thompson stumbled back. Um, and that's all part of the game. If you stumble back, it's a lot of balance. You can capitalize on that. Jeff and Neil didn't want to win that way. He's like, like come back up to your feet. Let's just do this as clean as we can. What utter, utter respect. Um, you really enjoy it to, to see that as long as, um, as well as the actual performance of the, of the bat itself. Jeff and Neil, he'll definitely be back and, and, and looking strong, looking dominant. And this is a fight that we could possibly see him run at some kind in the future if Thompson stays in our long to do so. But he's proven himself to be uh, a contender now. Yeah, 100%. 100%, mate. He was. Uh... Very, very impressive. Stephen Thompson is so experienced as well. Yeah. But like he's generally like he's very respectful of his opponents generally. Yes. Um you know, there's been the odd thing over the years, but generally he's very um you know, very respectful and that sort of thing. Um yeah. I've gotta say, I thought um Stephen Thompson his footwork is so good. It's like nice even the like the speed of his kicks and I find it almost mesmerizing as i'm watching it like i really mm. enjoy watching his fights um but jeff neal um yeah i liked i enjoyed his performance and i think that was a phenomenal fight to finish off what has been a, a phenomenal year's fight from the ufc particularly but but mma i think has done a, a fantastic job for us as fans um in 2020, it's been a difficult year for you know various reasons. Um, many fights have been, you know fallen through for COVID and for things linked to that. But ultimately, we could have had a year of no combat sports and nothing to watch and gets through this. And I yeah. think people need to, you know, Dana White and Graham Boylan and, and and people from Bellator, they deserve an amazing amount of credit for getting it done. And getting it done safely for the fighters and for the cameramen and the commentators. Because I think without that, I think 2020 would have been even worse. So, you know, I have looking back, I really appreciate it. Um, no UFC till the 16th of uh, January, which gives us a bit of, um, a bit of a gap. So 
I think we have got some phenomenal guests joined up, uh, sort of lined up for the coming weeks. Um, what I think we'll do, mate, is probably, well, there's two ways we could do, and I'd love to hear from people what they think we could do. We could either go for a slightly kind of shorter show, like about an hour, and just have a guest on and just kind of, you know, talk to them, interview them, have a chat that way. Or we could revert back to the, we'll find out what, or we'll go back and have a look where we were with our retro reviews, do them for a few weeks, because people did enjoy them, um, and then just sort of talk any news and stuff, take some questions at the end of the show where people can send in stuff for us to talk about or fights they want yeah. to watch. I mean, what do you think about, you know, seeing what people write in regards like the, the super fights from the past that want to get reviewed again? Um, yeah. So what, would, what do we do before? Be we, we, um, we, would, we would be reviewing the UFCs in order and then yeah. we were also having people send in a particular fight they wanted us to look, whether it was boxing yeah, yeah. And, or and MMA. Just, or... Yeah, not just UFC. I mean, you know, Strike Force had amazing matches. You know, WBC had an amazing part. Um, real, real classic ones. So we could just go back and, and, and watch a couple of super fights from there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, Danny at Danny Button FS or Ace Podcast Nation. Um, tell us what. Like, basically, we'll go. We'll review the next UFC show from where we were. I'll go back and have a look. But it will also look at one sole fight on its own. If you'd like us to look at a particular fight. Send it to us. The only condition is it has to either be on YouTube or on UFC Fight Pass so that we've got easy access to it. Or if you can point us to a link to a particular fight, then obviously that's great. But um, yeah, send it in. Send us in. Um, as soon as the UFC starts back up on the 16th, that week, we will we'll start the guests up and rolling again. Uh, and like I said, we've got some really interesting ones. We've got uh, we've got a line. We've got a journalist lined up. We've got a, a commentator lined up. We've got a couple of fighters lined up who haven't been on the show before. So um, some real great stuff. Some also some some legends and and whatnot. So some new faces, and I'm sure we'll have some uh, regular faces as well. But uh, really looking forward to it. Um, thank you to everyone who's uh, supported us up to now, downloaded and watched. Have a fantastic Christmas. I know it's difficult, but uh, just do what you can. And uh, to have a great time. We will be back next week um, for our first retro review. Um, but yeah, Danny, have a fantastic Christmas, mate. Yeah, everyone have a good Christmas. I have, have a great Christmas. And uh, yeah, don't let this lockdown keep you down. You know, you've got to stay positive. And 2021 is going to be a better year. Yeah, mate, it can't yeah, be any worse. Yeah. As I, just um, don't let him get you down. Ladies and gentlemen, healthy body, healthy mind. Don't let them break you. Keep going. Yeah. Keep on keeping on. And uh, we'll be back next week to, to give you an hour or so's release from the crazy goings on of the world. Until then, thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.